Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't we just take one more minute? Lord, we love you. We praise you tonight, God. There is no other name. There is no one like you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. What a good, good God. Well, I am so thankful to be in the house of the Lord. He is just so good. <laughs> and that's all I have to say. We're done. Bye. <laughs> no, I, I am truly amazed by his goodness. And I love how he confirms his word. And his presence is so sweet. Why don't we stand? I actually didn't have a title for tonight's um, lesson until a couple hours ago. <laughs> um, but I hopefully tonight can talk about position and praise. Let's go to 2 Samuel 6. Verses 14 through 16. If you remember the last time I was up here, I talked about David and his wife, Michael, um, and accessible images, something that the Lord put on my heart, how his wife reached for the idol in their home when David fled from Saul, her father, and how we must be careful what we reach for in times of distress and fear. And it was during the pre preparation of this lesson that I got that one. So I've been holding on to this for a while. Um, and for good reason, because I think the Lord wanted to show me a little bit more. But 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 14 through 16 says, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she, she despised him in her her heart. Lord, I ask that you please anoint this message. I know what you have given me. I hope, Lord God, that I don't put my words in your word. And I hope, Lord God, that everyone listening can receive the revelation that you want them to receive tonight in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. So it's clear when we are reading this, these scriptures that David and Michael maybe not these scriptures specifically, but the ones that I did before, um, and anytime they're mentioned together, they really did love one another. Um, but they were spiritually different. David believed in the one true almighty God, but it was likely that Michael did not. And in this passage, we get another glimpse of her heart and another glimpse into their spiritual priorities. David is publicly praising the Lord through dance as the people of God are celebrating the return of the Ark of the Lord. And as King David is praising and dancing with his people, Michael spots him from the window. In just two verses, we learn two things. I'm sure there's more, but these are two things that the Lord gave to me. The first one is David allowed himself to openly praise the Lord in spite of looking foolish. That's very hard to do. <laughs> and the second thing that the Lord uh, opened my eyes to was that Michael was separated from the celebration. Something that we should take into account. She did not consider herself to be part of the house of Israel, or she did not want to uh, be part of the celebration. And to me, I think that this was a really big deal, especially to the children of Israel. Everyone was present to witness this incredible victory. 
everyone was united in singing and in music. The Bible says, so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord, all except for his wife, all except for Michal, who positioned herself in a high place rather than be with the crowd. So normally we as parents and as leaders, we usually advise young people not to follow the crowd. I know we've heard that uh, probably more times in our life than we want to admit. But I remember when my mom really encouraged me not to dress a certain way because she knew that I was just doing it because it was a trendy thing to do. And she knew it actually didn't look good on me at all. I still did it anyway uh, because I wanted to fit in. But she wanted me to really think for myself is really the bottom line. She didn't want me to follow what they were doing. And I know people like to say the phrase, you know, if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you follow them? And I'm like, gosh, it's a little extreme, but I get the sentiment, okay? No, I would not do that. But they want you to think for yourself and not be influenced by other voices and other people who may care less about your well-being. And that's what a good leader does. At least what they should do is they should look out for the people that they love and that they have authority over. But I don't believe that Michael separating herself from the crowd to go to a higher place was to be a good leader or to be a good example. I truly think that Michael had no interest in being part of this crowd the people who followed a different God. The word tells us when Michal noticed her husband, King David, dancing, she despised him in her heart. It's a very strong word. And with this information, we may also speculate that just maybe, and this is obviously going, you know, into where my mind goes, is maybe the overlooking from the window to the celebration is a metaphor for how she felt towards everybody else. Maybe. JC's gospel here. But the king's wife separated herself. This is the fact. The king's wife separated herself from this monumental event, separated herself from the crowd, from the people that her husband was in charge of. The ark of God was returning to Jerusalem There would have been great anticipation and excitement surrounding this. It wasn't as if somebody just took the ark of the Lord and was walking it around the block like a dog, you know, and bringing it back. This was not a casual thing. This was a very holy thing. The ark was returning home. And we can get a feeling of just how joyful everyone was if we read this entire story. And if we go back to 2 Samuel 6 and 5, it says, And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. I probably butched some of those. But but basically, David, upon seeing the ark, must have remembered those times as a shepherd boy in the field, how he would play music and worship God. Maybe seeing the ark reminded him of when the prophet Samuel came and anointed his head with oil with the promise that he would someday be crowned king. I wonder if seeing the ark brought David back to the time when the Lord helped him defend the sheep from predators, preparing him for defeating the mighty enemy of his people, Goliath. David began to join everyone as they played instruments and praised God. Before Michael saw David dance, he was united with his people in praise towards their God. He had a heart of worship to the one true God. And even though he was king, and there was no doubt certain royal protocols, I'm sure, that he needed to follow, that he was supposed to behave, he stepped out of the norm in order to give the Lord praise. David was not sitting on his throne up high somewhere next to Michael, watching God's people rejoice. His love for God placed him with the people, in the midst of the people, his heart rejoicing alongside the people of God. 
And our praise is an extension of our honor to God. And this does not mean that loud praise equals better praise, as sometimes we think in the modern church, or that quiet praise is less honorable praise. Your praise should reflect your faith. And during this moment of celebration, something tragic happened, and I'm going to summarize it. But you can find the details in 2 Samuel 6, 6 through 11. But the oxen shook the ark as they were moving it. And in his instinct, instinct, a man named Uzzah grabbed hold of the ark of God. And the Lord struck him dead right there. This made David very upset and fearful towards the Lord. And so he decided not to bring the ark directly into the city of David right away. And so for three months, the ark went to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the Lord blessed him and everyone in his house. Second Samuel 6, 12 says, And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom, and all that pertaineth unto him, because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. David heard the great news. They weren't struck dead. <laughs> we can bring it home now. And he brought, he brought the ark of God home with gladness, with joy, with glee. I want you to understand that he was increasing in this excitement to have the ark of the Lord back. Then they who carried the ark took six steps, and David sacrificed oxen and fatlings. He could not contain his joy. That fire shut up in his bones. 2 Samuel 6, 14 through 15 says, And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. It is very okay to rejoice when God brings the good out of a terrible situation. We should rejoice and praise him for it, to take time to appreciate what the Lord has done. And sometimes I understand that we are busy. We don't take time to acknowledge his blessings before moving on to the next thing. We should rejoice and praise the Lord for every victory, no matter how small it seems to us. In commentary from Matthew Henry, he says this, and I included it because I really liked what he said. As secret worship is better, the more secret it is. So public worship is better the more public it is. And we have reason to rejoice when restraints are taken off. And the ark of God finds welcome in the city of David and has not only the protection and the support, but the countenance and encouragement of the civil powers. For joy of this they play before the Lord. Note, public joy must always be as before the Lord, with an eye to him and terminating in him, and must not degenerate into that which is carnal and sensual. So let us not push away public praise because we're afraid of what it's going to look like to somebody else. We all have the ability to carnally dance and shout in the church. We are flesh. We are human. We've done it. I'm sure we've seen it. But in our awareness, sometimes it hinders our obedience. And in that fear of becoming like that, then we hold back public praise. 2 Samuel 6, 16 through 19 says, And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place, in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. This king was prepared. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well to the women as men, to everyone a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. So after David cheerfully rejoiced, he cheerfully gave. 
And after the Lord blessed David, he blessed his people. An outpouring of giving. Then everyone went home, probably full of joy, because joy is contagious. But only those who are willing to rejoice with those who rejoice will also be blessed. Not those who judge when others rejoice. 2 Samuel 6.20 says, Then David returned to bless his household. He was on a mission. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David. She didn't let him get very far. Sometimes we do that. Lord, help us, ladies. And said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. It's actually very nasty words if you look into it. The people were full of joy. They were full of what they needed. Their king provided by the grace of God. They had a king who loved Jesus. They had a king who worshipped with them. Everybody was full of joy. There was this overflow of giving. And then when David poured out and shared the joy with others, he returned to bless his own household. He wasn't done with his mission, but he did not get very far. She did not come out to rejoice with the people of God. She did not come out to celebrate the victory with her husband. She only came out to criticize and to cast judgment on how he praised. If we are not careful, we will look at those outwardly praising God and ministering to the people of God, and we will pick apart how they do it. As we sit back behind a window, not part of the joy. Or we will have a sour attitude towards someone who is fully in the will of God because of our own flesh, and a wholesome moment becomes, becomes a point of contention within us against that person. When others are doing the work of the Lord and blessing the people of God, we truly must be careful not to criticize and ignore all the good things that God is doing around us. People were being blessed. They were being loved. But Michal was only concerned with her husband, the king, doing something embarrassing. Sometimes we have family members like that. <laughs> we're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're doing this right now. <laughs> but maybe they're in the will of God. So pray about it. But David's mission was to build up his people. Michal's mission was to tear down. Doesn't he know who he is? How a real king should behave? This is how I feel the commentary would be in her mind. I could be wrong, but. Often we will find after a moment of joy in the presence of God, we're ready to share that joy with others, and something shows up to challenge our faith. Michael says to David, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. See, something that was meant to be holy, she made perverse. David was rejoicing through the lens of his faith, but his wife could only view it through the lens of his status, of her idea of what a proper king should do, should behave. And her point of view was one of perversion, not David's praise. Lord Jesus, please help us to never look at another person praising God and have harmful thoughts about them. Forgive us, Lord. By all means, let's pray for discernment if we're concerned. By all means, let's pray for that person from afar. Maybe not lay your hands on them if you feel that way towards them. You know. But in our attitude, Lord, please help us that we shouldn't be the judge and bring shame, especially if they're having a holy moment. And not to make it about myself, but I always have to share from, you know, experience. But I can remember even the first couple months of coming into church. My husband could attest to this, but I was so new. I was so ignorant about many things and still, and still am. I can confess that for sure. But 
I heard a lot of comments. I saw a lot of facial expressions. And I heard a lot of things saying that the only reason I was even here was because I was dating a church boy. It was only partly true. <laughs> People used to call me names. They used to say hurtful things to me. And I don't mean in this church, just to clarify. And I had to decide whether it would, let, it would affect how I praised him. And thankfully, I didn't let it affect me. Because they didn't understand how God met me way before the moment they saw me. And that God had used that church boy to confirm truth to this broken girl who had been secretly seeking the Lord before I even lifted up a praise or even knew what that word even meant. <laughs> and that's my testimony now. But a lot of people don't have that testimony because the moment they saw that rejection, they thought their praise wasn't worth it. What they saw as perverse, God saw as obedience. And we do not know all that God is doing inside of a person. The outside does not tell us the whole story. 2 Samuel 6, 21 through 23 says, And David said unto Michal, It was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord, and I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be base in my own sight. And of the maidservants which thou hadst spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children unto the day of her death. The word of God always shares things for a purpose. And that little tag on, I don't think was just a tag on. David stands up for the truth and for his faith. He braces her that he is not going to change. And actually, in fact, he's going to be more obnoxious. He's going to be more exuberant. He's going to praise harder. And it will move the very maidservants that she mentioned to honor. You may think that you're better than somebody else because you don't act as foolish as they do during service or during praise. Or you have worked hard to keep your composure to save your ministry status or the status you've built up in your own mind. But God is not going to birth spiritual things through that attitude. He will pour out blessings to those who have no fear of man to those who choose to worship like no one is watching, to give praise to the God of heaven for who he is and what he has done because he is worthy. We do not get to decide how someone worships or praises the Lord. He decides that, and he will deal with them. And he decides what is pleasing, pleasing to himself, and it does not have to please us. It's not about us. It's about him. So let's revisit David's why, why he praises the Lord the way he does. 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 3. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided him a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord, and call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will shew thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. The Lord sends the prophet Samuel to anoint David as the next king of Israel. And as you read through the details, God rejects Eliab. David's older brother, and tells Samuel to not look on the outward appearance, for the Lord looketh on the heart. And one by one, Jesse presents each son, but Samuel says none of them are the chosen one. And finally, he asks Jesse if, there are, if these are all of his children, and he admits that there is one left, the youngest one in the field, watching over the sheep, doing his brother's work probably, the one who always gets looked over, the one who is considered a throwaway, the runt of the litter. 
When David finally stood in the presence of his father and the prophet Samuel, the Lord says in 1 Samuel 16, 12, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. This is he whom I have chosen to leave my people. This is he whom I, the Lord, can see his heart and know that he has what it takes to be the king because he loves his God and he knows my voice. For this is he, the one no one saw coming, the one that nobody thought was a threat, the small, obedient shepherd boy who spent hours alone watching the sheep and singing and playing music unto the Lord. Get up and anoint that one. Anoint him with oil. For this is he, this is the one. He wasn't chosen because of his physical strength. He was chosen because of his spiritual obedience. And the more time that we spend in the presence of God, the stronger he's going to make you spiritually. Not so that we can be glorified, but that through our obedience and our service to God, he can be lifted up. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. David was telling Michael, this is my why. This is why I will praise and worship the Lord. This is why I will play music and rejoice. Yeah, you can scoff. You can say all these harmful things. But before you even got here, he was taking care of me. And I remember what God did for me when I was looked by everyone else except for God. And I remember when my brothers ignored me. And I remember when my father didn't think I was worth it, even, not even to introduce me to the prophet. But right in the middle of being overlooked, he saw me. He knew my heart more than anyone. And he blessed me in the midst of all those people who thought I was not good enough by their standards. And I owe the Lord my praise because he chose me long before you and long before this moment, long before all the present events happening in my life, the the Lord appointed me and I'm giving him praise even because, or even more because he is worthy. You know, over a decade of being a Christian, I'm still learning, I'm still growing, and we we really always should be striving to be that way, and I need to repent every single day. But I found that when there is joy and peace, there are some people that reject it because they want to be a serious believer. You know what I'm talking about. (laughs) But isn't that the complete opposite of what the Bible says? Maybe Michael thought David wasn't taking his role as king seriously by rejoicing and dancing for the Lord. Maybe she was so consumed with her legalistic thinking and programming that seeing somebody embracing the liberty that the Spirit of God brings made her uncomfortable. But instead of asking God why or trying to reevaluate the way she was reacting or what her beliefs were to something so pure and beautiful, she chose to criticize And I can tell you this, if we focus all of our energy into paying attention to God more than we pay attention to each other, no offense, (laughs) the church as a whole would be unstoppable. And I don't just mean here, it's a literal whole. (laughs) The church as the body of Christ, as believers together. And think what could happen if our focus just shifted. How much deeper of a walk with God would we have if instead of saying, how glorious did they praise God wearing that today or doing that today, but we instead rejoice and said, God, you're doing something. I don't see it all. I don't understand it all, but I know you, and I trust that you know their heart, and I need to trust in your plan for their life, which may be different than mine, but I'm so glad that they didn't let anything hinder their praise to you. When the building is going to fill up with people that don't understand standards or protocol. When they're going to be here giving their all to God. Lord, help us. If we are sitting, scowling, with our arms folded, picking apart how they're doing it or how they look doing it. Yeah, they'll need teaching. That's part of discipleship. And we've all been there. But the love of God is not going to to flow through the disdain of the saints or our clever sarcasm or our sly digs. I don't know anybody who was saved by an eye roll. (laughs) 
I know it didn't save me, but God used it to open my eyes to realize how other people are not God and that I have to keep my focus on only one, the only one who matters. 2 Samuel 6, 23, it ended this way. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children unto the day of her death. Your praise is going to inspire and offend, and those who will rejoice with you will be blessed. But those who don't will be spiritually barren. God will handle the skeptics, and he will handle the naysayers, but you keep praising the Lord. And do not worry what other people think of you. You show up. You give him the praise that he is due. With all your heart, the Lord will take care of them. You be obedient in your praise, and he is going to grow your faith. I am coming to a close. You can stand. In the next chapter, Nathan the prophet brings David this message of covenant and hope from the Lord. David is so overcome with gratitude when he receives this from him. And this is David's response. And I wanted to end with this in 2 Samuel 7, 18 through 22. Then went King David in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hither into? And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God. But thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of man, O Lord God? And what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. For thy word's sake and according to thine own heart, thou hast done all these great things to make thy servant know them. Wherefore, thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. God is due more praise than we are ever able to provide. But what you can do, do it. He will honor whatever you bring, and you will be blessed and he will take care of you. He accepts what we are willing to give. So why don't we take a moment, raise our hands, share our gratitude through praise with our Lord. Think about what he's done in your life so far. Think about your own testimony, how far God has brought you. God, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have done. There is no one that can do what you do. Lord, we give you honor. We give you praise in this place tonight. I'm going to give you a preview of something that is on backlog. We're talking about Worshiping the Lord in liberty and in freedom. Uh, and David did so because he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the city of David. And yet, we have that presence of God dwelling within us already. So we can rejoice because that Shekinah glory is indwelling us. We don't need the fanfare or the fear because he's poured his spirit out upon us and that spirit is living within us. And then I think to how we also want this, this move of the spirit uh, in our lives and in our ministries and, and the Lord sent his disciples out two by two uh, and they came back rejoicing that, quote, even the demons are subject to us. And, and the Lord was not surprised by that, nor was he impressed by that. He says, don't rejoice about such minor things, but rejoice in that your name is written in the book of life. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have placed yourself in his hand, 
no one can pluck you out of that hand. And we spoke a little bit about that on Sunday, the peace of God. And so we have two great reasons to worship Him without limitation and without uh, reservation. And if it weren't, and if those weren't enough, just think about the wonderful nature of a God who, being all-powerful, all-holy, chose also to be all love and would pour his spirit out so that he can dwell within us and who would sacrifice himself so that we would have our names written in the book of life. Lord Jesus, I ask right now that you would move within us and that you would make real the joy of the Lord, that you would help us to overcome our reservations and our own imposed limitations, but that you would release us to worship in liberty and with exuberance as is our desire. Set us free, I pray, Lord, from our own hesitations and our own uh, hang-ups. But Lord, help us to see you so fully that the joy overflows us. And we cannot help but shout, holy is the Lord. Lord, I ask that you uh, move in us today. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sister JC. Thank you, everybody. It's good to see you tonight. God bless you. You are dismissed.